speaking to us about adaptive evolution of gene expression. So Hunter, welcome. We look forward right. to your talk. Thank you, Michael. It's great to be back here at Berkeley. Let's see, uh, a few things have changed, but really, it seems like I still can feel my way around campus. That's good to know. I haven't been away for too, too long. So uh, today, I'd like to tell you guys about some work from my lab for the past a couple of years, we've been working on adaptive evolution of gene expression. And so I just want to start out by saying that we can really, between any two species or even subspecies that we want to compare, we can now, using technologies like high throughput RNA sequencing, very easily come up with a list of all the expression levels of every gene within that organism. So that's pretty straightforward at this point. And then we can take those lists and compare them between, say, two species that we might be interested in. In. And so we can actually see from all these different comparisons now from many different uh, regions of the tree of life that we can always find thousands of gene expression differences between any two species we look at, no matter how closely related those are. So I think the message here is just that these changes accumulate very rapidly. There's really not much barrier to be accumulating large-scale changes in gene expression. And so that, that much has become clear, but I think a more important question that we should be asking ourselves, given this information, is which out of this vast multitude of gene expression changes have actually been adaptive and have contributed to the, the evolution of fitness of these organisms, as opposed to simply being neutral. So they could be there simply because they're not being opposed by selection, and so because they're not doing any harm, they're allowed to drift in some cases to a high frequency, and then we end up seeing them accumulate between these species. And this, I think, is a much more difficult question to answer than simply what are the differences, because it requires a, a much more nuanced understanding of what's going on between these different species. And that is the, one of the main driving themes or questions uh, in my lab going on today. And so that's uh, much of what I'd like to tell you about today is our recent work on that. So before I get there, I just want to introduce a little bit of terminology. So in general, when we have a gene expression difference between two strains or two species, uh, there's two general flavors that this can come in, and that is either cis or trans acting. So a cis acting change is a mutation that is actually linked on the same chromosome to the allele that it's regulating. So for example, in a promoter or an enhancer region, you could have a mutation, uh, this X right here, that affects a nearby gene. So that would be a cis acting change. Whereas in contrast, a trans acting change is, could be uh, encoded anywhere in the genome, such as on a different chromosome. In this example, we have a coding region mutation in a transcription factor that makes a mutant mRNA, which then makes a mutant protein. And then that mutant protein, that transcription factor, can go on and regulate any number of other genes in the genome. <laughs> and because it acts through this diffusible intermediate, this protein, then that is a trans acting change. So we have these two basic types, and I'll be referring to these terms uh, throughout the talk. All right, so one, I think, really big question in the field that's been quite controversial is whether cis regulation has been the primary fuel of, of evolutionary adaptation. And so, you know, since if we are interested in figuring out the basis of adaptation, then this is a pretty important question for us to understand. And I think uh, it's been a lot of interest for that reason. And it's been quite controversial because on the one hand, there's been some very powerful personalities in the field that have said that really this, it appears that, that cis regulation is the main driving force uh, underlying many, if not uh, most, types of evolutionary adaptation, whereas others have been saying, hold on, we really don't have that many examples yet to extrapolate from, and we really want to you know, hold out for the data to see which, whether this is really true or not. And so if you look at what examples are out there uh, of these well-established regulatory adaptations, there are uh, some, some really beautiful ones. So these have mainly been from three different model organisms, Drosophila fruit flies, stickleback fish, and mice. And so each of these examples uh, from these different organisms actually involves some really beautiful biology, uh, some of it done by Berkeley faculty. But I think at the end of the day, if you just count up the number of examples we have, where it's this, these really well-studied examples, it's actually quite a small number. So depending exactly how you do your counting, you might come up with about a dozen or so examples. And this is across all species that we have. So uh, we have a relatively small number of examples, and yet, some people in the field would really want to conclude from that that this is a really driving force, that cis regulation really is the primary fuel of evolutionary adaptation. And so I think it's, it's really hard to make that conclusion, but my lab is trying to work on creating more examples and more methods to actually let us 
figure out whether that is the case. Really, they conclude from first principles, not from that. Well, I think it's a combination of principles as well as citing these evidence. So people do say the principles are there, but at the same time, it's, uh, you know, they'll point to say, you know, in 10 out of 10 examples that we have, it's been cis regulation. Whereas e even that statement, I, I would have an argument with, but, but that has been, has been said in the literature. So you might wonder then, if this, if this let's say this is such a, a pervasive uh, form of adaptation, then why is it that we have so few examples? Well, I think a, a very large part of the reason is each example has actually taken quite a bit of work to figure out. As I'm sure Craig Miller and others could tell you, um, this is, this is a, a pretty major undertaking. So this is a figure that I stole from a review paper uh, by Barrett and Hoekstra, where they're just going through uh, some of the major steps involved in pinpointing one of these adaptations, in this case with sticklebacks. So I won't go through all the details here, but uh, just suffice it to say, even just you know, single steps here, such as QTL mapping, can take years of work. And then even once you have these QTL maps, you might have a, a region of the genome that you've implicated, which might have 50 or 100 genes in it, and you have to figure out which of those genes you're going to follow up on to do the more laborious transgenic lines and so forth. So this is really many, many years of work from whole teams of people required to, to uh, actually establish these examples. So while this isn't the only reason, I think it's a major part of why we actually still have so few examples. So that brings me to the motivation for, for what my lab is working on. So on the one hand, we're trying to develop new methods for being able to detect these gene expression adaptations, not just at the level of single gene, but perhaps to do it in a more systematic genome-wide type of way. And then second of all, applying these methods in order to make new biological discoveries of these expression adaptations in a, a wide range of species. So for today, I decided just to focus on uh, two different areas that we've been working on. One is local gene expression adaptations in recent human evolution, and the second one is the evolution of translation in yeast. So we'll start out uh, with this human story. So the two main questions driving this uh, project in human adaptation is first of all, uh, this question that I already posed, what is the relative importance of the regulatory, in particular cis regulatory changes, uh, versus protein sequence changes in recent human adaptation? And second of all, if we actually do have some examples of this uh, uh, regulatory changes, what specific pathways have actually been subject to these regulatory adaptations in humans? And so this first question about the relative importance really uh, was posed, I think, uh, you know, first by King and Wilson, in particular in, context, in the context of human evolution. So they, uh, this was back in 1975, so they didn't have access to all the fancy genomes and transcriptomes that we have now. They were really just actually uh, doing some, some much more uh, basic kind of analysis and forming the hypothesis that because the protein coding regions of many of these genes are quite similar between humans and chimps, then we can actually say, well, what else could be changing to give us such a large phenotypic difference between them? And they posited that perhaps it's changes in the regulation rather than changes in the actual structural proteins themselves that have given ri rise to uh, most of the major human adaptations. So uh, this has been a hypothesis now for, for quite some time, many decades. And I think it's uh, fair to say that even though this was posed quite a while ago and it's received a lot of attention, even uh, now we really only have a, a handful of anecdotal examples of human gene expression adaptations. So uh, lactase is certainly the, the most well-studied example uh, of a human gene expression adaptation. Uh, Duffy is another one. But really, we only have a couple of, of well-established examples. So we don't have anything like a, a genome-wide map of these uh, adaptations. And moreover, because we don't have a genome-wide map, and for other reasons as well, that we really haven't been able to have any kind of systematic comparison of the abundance of these regulatory changes versus the protein coding adaptations in humans. So this King and Wilson hypothesis, I think, has still been largely untested. Now, I just want to point out that there, have, there has actually been a lot of work in human evolution trying to implicate different uh, factors or regions in gene expression adaptation. And I just want to say that a couple of these methods, I really think, are um, really not able to tell us much about gene expression adaptation. In particular, some studies that have just uh, made big alignments between different genomes and look for regions of the non-coding DNA that have rapid divergence. And then saying, well, these are, tell us something about gene expression 
adaptation. I think it's really hard to make that connection uh, for a couple of reasons. One is it could just be a mutation hotspot, we really can't say. Another re reason is because even if it is some region under positive selection, we usually don't know whether that's actually involved in gene expression control or it could be something else like a non-coding RNA or anything else uh, that's out there in the genome. So this, it's really hard to make that connection. Another connection that people have often tried to make is saying accelerated gene expression divergence. When you actually go and measure gene expression in different species, that that might equal gene expression adaptation. Again, I think that's really hard to say, in part because oftentimes people are looking at these different uh, gene expression samples taken from different species that have very different environments and diets and so forth. So you could have a lot of changes for that reason. And second of all, we also just don't know how fast a neutral gene expression level would evolve because we don't know are there what would be a neutral gene. So without knowing what is the neutral rate of divergence, you really can't say what is faster than neutral. And so that becomes, again, another challenge. So I just wanted to point that out to you, that there have been a number of studies that have maybe touched on these kinds of issues, but really I think we're still lacking any more general understanding of gene expression adaptation. So then the question is, how can we actually compare these two classes, the coding and the regulatory, if we have all these different problems? Well, so one possibility might be if we could come up with a method to detect each class separately and then perhaps compare the numbers. So you just say, well, we have this many protein coding adaptations and this many gene expression adaptations. Which one is bigger? So that, I think, is very problematic uh, for a number of reasons, some of which I just went over. But, you know, basically any two methods that you come up with are going to have different properties, different levels of statistical power and so forth, and you really just can't make that kind of direct comparison. So I think that is really just not an option in this case. So a second possibility is to try to detect putative adaptations without any type of mechanistic bias as to whether they're coding or regulatory. And then once you have those, you could try to count the proportion of them that are regulatory or that are non-synonymous, that are coding, changing the actual protein. And so then you might actually be able to make a more fair comparison. So identifying the ones that are non-synonymous, which are changing an amino acid, is easy enough because we know we have the genetic code, so we can just look at any protein coding sequence and see, yep, yeah, that one changes an amino acid. So that one is pretty easy. But what about counting up the proportion of regulatory? How do we actually know which genetic variants would actually have an effect on gene regulation? So there's two ways that we could get about doing this. Uh, one is looking at what are called eSNPs, or expression-associated <laughs> SNPs. And so these are just SNPs in the human genome or any genome that uh, have a statistical association with the expression level of some gene. So what I'm showing here is each little point, it represents a different human individual in which uh, the expression level of this gene, PREP1, has been measured in some particular type of cell. And so you have three different genotypes that these individuals could have at, a, at one particular site in their genome. And so depending on which genotype they have, you see different levels of PREP1. And so we could say from this that it's uh, likely that either this SNP or one nearby in which disequilibrium with this is actually affecting the levels of CREB1 in this whatever <laughs> tissue or cell type this is. So this is one type of association we can use called the eSNP. The other uh, is what uh, it's called CRE-SNP. This stands for cis regulatory element SNP. And so this is something uh, a little bit more general where it's just any genetic variants that are located in regions of the genome that we know beforehand have some role in cis regulation, specifically enhancer regions as well as promoters nearby the transcription start sites. Any SNP in there, we could say we don't know if it's actually having an effect on the regulation or not, but it's more likely than some random SNP that's not in one of these regions to be having an effect. So at least it would be an enriched subset for those. All right, so now that's how we can actually detect, two ways we can detect classes of SNPs or any genetic variants that are associated with gene expression levels or, or likely uh, to affect expression. So now another question is, well, how could we identify these putative adaptations to begin with? And so I think environmental association is a pretty good approach for this. So in general, this is just looking for a correlation between the allele frequencies in different populations uh, within your species and then and the environment. So any, any aspect of the environment, it could be geography or climate or anything, you could then look for such a correlation and try to draw inferences from that. So perhaps the most famous such case in humans is the correlation between the incidence of malaria in Africa and the frequency of sickle cell heterozygotes. And you can see there is a clear correspondence. And that is thought to be because uh, you do get some level of resistance to malaria when you're a heterozygous for the sickle cell allele. And so that 
uh, is a, a pretty well-established example where you get this, this correlation between the frequency of an allele and this, in this case, uh, the, the environmental variable, which is the frequency of malaria in that region. So now we can go on, uh, and other people have already developed methods for doing this in a more systematic way. So Graham Koop's lab a couple years ago developed a method uh, for doing this genome-wide, and Angela Hancock in 2011 applied this to a large uh, human genotype data set. And so what they did was basically take a collection of nine different climate variables. These are anything from temperature and sunlight to more geographic variables like latitude, and they just say, all right, among our nine variables, when we compare those, to allele frequencies that have been measured across 61 worldwide diverse human populations. And so we have these allele frequencies measured at 630,000 markers or SNPs throughout the genome. Then can we find correlations above and beyond what you would expect to see just by background population structure? And so they have a, uh, a sophisticated approach for controlling for that that I won't go into. But basically they can come up with a ranking of which SNPs they think are most likely to have these associations with particular environmental variables. Okay, so they can just create a ranked list of all these 630,000 SNPs. And so one thing that they did in that 2011 paper was then bring in the non-synonymous SNPs and ask what fraction of these putative local adaptations are actually non-synonymous. And they found that there was a small but significant enrichment in most of these different uh, catalogs that they were able to come up with uh, between an enrichment of non-synonymous in their local adaptations, and they said, well, that is evidence that we're finding something real here. It's not just that we're pulling out random noise from the genome, because if it was random noise, it wouldn't be enriched for these non-synonymous SNPs. So they used that to argue that we are likely to be finding some real signals of local adaptation. In particular, the overlaps would be likely uh, non-synonymous cases where the protein is actually changing. So what I decided to do was just to add in one more uh, little bit to this flowchart, and that is to bring in the cis-regulatory SNPs. And so you can do the exact same analogous type of analysis here, where you have now a list of cis-regulatory SNPs, which are E-SNPs or Cree-SNPs, and you overlap them with the local adaptations, and now you get these putative cis-regulatory local adaptations. And so the <coughs> E-SNPs that I was using for this came from a compilation of 15 different studies that covered seven different human cell types, and the Cree-SNPs uh, <coughs> came from nine different cell types. So, so covering you know, a small portion, but still um, multiple cell types. So now, go, looking under the hood here at how it works, uh, if you care about such details, you can take this list of all the 630,000 SNPs, and so we uh, basically have them ranked from the Hancock study from strongest association with some type of variable down to the weakest. And so at the very top of the list, we take the top half a percent, and we say these are the putative local adaptation SNPs for whatever climate variable we're looking at. And now at the bottom, we have what we think of as negative controls. So the entire lower half of this list, these are pretty much just any SNPs that don't show association. And so we can choose sets of these of equal size to here, match for things like haplotype length and frequency, which are important to control for, and then do any kind of comparison we want in terms of the enrichment uh, in our actual list of these local adaptation SNPs versus the negative controls. And if we see, say, more non-synonymous SNPs up here than in the negative controls, or more regulatory SNPs, then that tells us that we're actually enriching for those in the, these, uh, these local adaptations. OK, so the way I'll actually show you these enrichments is as follows. Uh, so here I'm showing you one climate variable uh, and with very small font to make sure that you can't read it. So this is, this is average max summer temperature, so that's just one climate variable. And so the y-axis here is the number of overlaps more than expected by chance. So what's expected by chance is given to us by these negative controls. So if you have something above zero, that means we're getting more than what we see in negative controls. And so the green bar here, it says non-syn. That just means it's a non-synonymous amino acid changing mutation. So here we have about eight more than we would expect to see by chance. Okay, that doesn't mean much by itself, but it can tell us a little bit more when we put it in the context of these E-SNPs and Cree-SNPs. So for this one uh, climate variable, when we do the same analysis, but now including E-SNPs and Cree-SNPs, we actually see substantially more. Uh, the red is E-SNPs, the blue is Cree-SNPs, and the purple is a combination of both where we got rid of any redundancies between them. And so you can see that for this climate variable, we actually have quite a few more overlaps. That is, more of these putative adaptations are actually affecting gene regulation than they are affecting the protein coding sequence. 
And so we could do this not just for this one, but for all of our different climate and ge geographic variables. And you can see that for all but one of them, this one over here, you see the same general pattern, which is that the green bar, the non-synonymous, is quite small, whereas the red and blue tend to be much bigger. And so what this tells us is that we're actually seeing much more enrichment of these different classes of regulatory SNPs in these putative local adaptations than we do of the non-synonymous. So even though non-synonymous is more than you expect by chance, we're getting about tenfold more on top of that for the regulatory ones. So it's important with this kind of analysis to always test whether you're really you know, looking at something real here or if there's something weird going on. So you can do a number of negative controls. Uh, one of the best ones you could do is just to randomize your data and then test your, to rerun all of your, your computer code on that randomized data. So when we do that, we see all these patterns just disappear, which is what you would hope because now this is randomized data. It's also important not just randomizing the data, but really thinking about what you're testing here and whether there's any possible biases in your analysis. And there are a number of pretty important biases here that uh, could have a pretty strong effect on the results. So in particular, I'm thinking about biases between the regulatory and the non-synonymous SNPs. So for example, we know where all the common non-synonymous SNPs are in the human genome. We have enough genomes now that we can just look them up. That's pretty easy. But these eSNPs, many of them just haven't been mapped because we haven't looked in all the tissues or we haven't looked in enough samples. So we, we're just missing some of these. So that's one possible bias. Another one is that we actually don't know which of these eSNPs are actually causal due to this, this phenomenon of linkage disequilibrium. Uh, there's other biases, like the non-synonymous SNPs were overrepresented on this genotyping array. So these are getting into some of the details here. But the important point I want to make here is that actually all of these biases, all the ones that I've been able to think of at least, go in the same direction. And that is they all favor the finding more overlap with non-synonymous SNPs. And so because they all go in that same direction, and that direction actually counteracts the result that I actually found, which is the greater enrichment of the regulatory ones, I think what this means is that we're actually just making the, the results conservative. So when we find a tenfold difference of, of more regulation than non-synonymous, that's probably a conservative estimate due to all of these biases. Okay, so to summarize this first part, um, I think that these results are implying that these human local adaptations, at least revealed by this method of environmental association, are at least tenfold more likely to affect gene expression than they are to affect protein sequence. But as I said, this might underestimate the, uh, the actual role of gene expression due to all these biases that are inherent in that comparison. Okay, so that was the first part of the human story. I want to now turn to a second question, which is what are the specific pathways that have been subject to these types of regulatory adaptations in recent human evolution. And I already mentioned this lactase gene. So uh, this is a, a famous example because it fits very well with our understanding of human evolution. And so the general idea is that in populations that have developed uh, dairy farming over the past say, 10,000 years or so, there's been selective pressure to, for adults to be able to digest lactose. Previously, only babies and children would have to digest lactose, so there wasn't really much pressure for adults to. But once uh, cows and, and other dairy was around, then you could actually have that adults uh, using that as a, as a source of energy. And so we do see a, a pretty good correspondence then between regions of the world where you have this dairy farming and the ability to express this lactase enzyme, which lets you digest lactose, uh, and that extended expression throughout adulthood. So this is a very nice case, very well established, uh, of a gene expression adaptation in humans. But like I said, these we only really have maybe two or three cases uh, that are anything like this. I mean, this is by far the most well-established of those. So we can try to ask, now what specific genes or pathways might we be able to pull out from the same type of data that I was already showing you? So one thing we could do, just very simply just to begin with, is take particular tissues and take their sets of eSNPs that were found in that particular tissue and just ask what's the overlap between that and particular uh, sets of these environmental associations for a particular climate variable. So one of interest here would be the eSNPs that we found from skin, and we can overlap that with the SNPs that are associated with the amount of sunlight that each population receives in the summertime. And so when we look at that overlap, we find it is significantly enriched, so you have a, a couple fold overlap more than expected by chance. So that by itself is not terribly surprising. Uh, but what's really interesting is when we look within that overlap and ask what are the genes in that overlap, there's actually just one uh, functional category that's, that's very highly enriched, much, much more than any other, and that is uh, DNA damage response. 
And so you can just, these are the eSNPs, just some codes, uh, but with the target genes that they're regulating. And so these are, you know, it makes sense that they would be enriched here because uh, the DNA damage is what happens when skin meets sunlight. So it's something that, that does make sense um, biologically. Now just to show you one example of what one of these overlaps looks like. So this is a particular eSNP, um, and I'm going to compare the, its frequency in each human population that we looked at to the variable of summer solar radiation. So within, I'm going to do it separating it by continents. So this is just within Africa. So each, each line here is a different human population. And these gray points that are a little hard to see uh, represent the derived little frequency of this eSNP in that population. So you have different frequencies because each population has its own genetic makeup. And so uh, then you can see, basically, since these are arranged in order from having the least sunlight to the most sunlight, we can see the relationship between the amount of sunlight that they receive and the little frequency of this regulatory SNP. By the way, this is a SNP that regulates a tumor suppressor gene that actually activates DNA damage in response to UV radiation. So it makes sense that we're comparing it to sunlight. So that's within Africa. Uh, we can look in other regions of the world as well, and we see a roughly similar pattern if we look in uh, Western Eurasia. In East Asia, it's a little weaker, um, but the general pattern is there. And when you combine all the regions, it's very significant, much more than you'd expect by chance. So that is just one example of one of these. Now, we can do this, and yes, it is a significant overlap and might tell us something interesting, but it's actually this type of analysis is also ignoring a really key component of information that's within these eSNPs, and that is their directionality. So for every eSNP, we have two alleles, and one of those alleles causes higher expression of the gene, and the other one causes lower expression. And so we can actually use that information in a, a really important way to actually give us a lot more power to be able to find these types of effects. And in particular, the general idea here is <coughs> to look for selection happening on entire sets of genes, such as uh, a pathway, for instance. So if you do have selection on some trait, for instance, the DNA damage response, and, then, and that's ongoing for some time, then you probably will have time to accumulate multiple mutations that are pushing the expression of many genes in the same direction. So if you want to get higher uh, you know, response to DNA damage, you might be upregulating many of these different genes. So the idea here is that because we know the identities of many protein complexes or many <coughs> pathways in the human genome and many other genomes, we can use those as gene sets. So just a set of genes that we can ask whether we see a common direction of change. Uh, and if we do, that might tell us something about selection. So to give you a more specific example of how we do this in humans, let's say we have a pathway here with five different enzymes, uh, just a straight linear pathway. Now, each of these enzymes has an eSNP, a separate SNP in the genome that regulates its expression. And let's say we've identified these and measured it, their allele frequencies in this European population over here. And so the blue in the pie chart is the upregulating allele frequency, and the yellow is the downregulating frequency. So you can see for all five of these eSNPs, the blue, the upregulating frequency is higher. So that means we have high expression of this entire pathway. So now, if we look at another human population, say one over here in Eastern Asia, then you might see a different pattern. In this case, they all have much higher frequency of the down-regulating eSNP. And so because each of these changes is an independent event, these are different SNPs that are not linked to the genome, then it's very unlikely just by chance to be getting them all moving in the same direction. It's like flipping a coin uh, five different times and seeing it heads each time. So if it's just five, maybe that's not so unlikely, but if you do it 10 or 20 times, then you're really starting to get to statistical significance. So that's the general idea here uh, by which we can, uh, we can try to measure selection at the level of these gene sets in human <coughs> populations. So we do something to summarize all these, uh, all these allele frequencies that's just very naive, very simple, and that is when we have the upregulating allele frequencies for each of these eSNPs in one population, we'll just take the average, just simply take the mean of all of these upregulating allele frequencies and call that the expression score. So the reason to do that is just because it's nice to have a summary uh, for these next steps in the analysis. But the thing you can just remember is a high expression score means high expression of that gene set in a particular population. <coughs> so each population gets its own expression score because it has its own allele frequencies. So now what we can do is take our gene set, each of them has these eSNPs that are affecting expression, and we integrate them, like I said, just taking the average allele frequency to get the expression score. So now what do we do with these scores? 
Well, uh, we can then compare those scores to any population-specific variable we want. Just like I was telling you about before, this could be climate or geography. We just correlate each of them because we just have a number for each population, which we can line up with the numbers for the climate. And then we have a correlation between the two, which we just call the gene set variable association. So this is simply a, a simple correlation between the two. Now, just having correlation is not enough because we need to know, well, how strong should the correlation be before we believe it? So in order to tell that, what we do is we do the same process, but starting with random genes. So instead of a gene set, like a pathway, we'll just choose out a bunch of random genes with eSNPs from the same eSNP data set. And then we make random scores from that. We correlate them with the same uh, variables here, and then we create random associations. And we'll do this millions of times to get a whole distribution of these random associations. And then what we could do is ask whether the real association actually is an outlier when we compare it to this distribution of random ones. So if it is, let's say it's stronger than all of these different random ones, then we would say that has a significant p-value. That means that we never really expect to see that strong an association just by chance when we're controlling for population structure, which is what this process is doing. So that's the general outline here. Um, the data that we actually used to do this uh, was the exact same genotype, eSNP, and climate variables that I already told you about. The only difference here was adding in one more piece of information, which is the gene sets. We didn't even know how to group them together. And that we just got from some publicly available websites like the Gene Ontology. All right, so at the end of the day, crunching through all the data, we actually found just three significant gene sets after correcting for all this multiple testing that we were doing. So getting three after all that work is, on the one hand, maybe a little bit disappointing, but then on the other hand, it's nice because then I could tell you about all of them. And they're all actually, each of them is pretty interesting. So here's uh, the first one, uh, which is actually genes down-regulated in response to UV. So this is not actually a pathway that you would see in a textbook. This is just somebody did an experiment where they took some cells and exposed them to UV radiation and then just recorded which genes are down-regulated. So it's a bunch of different uh, types of, of genes in that list. So now when we look at that, then what we can do is actually have each point here is a human population. So we know the latitude at which that population resides, and we can compare that to the expression score for this gene set. Remember, that's just the amount of, of upregulation that we have over the entire gene set as based on the um, average upregulating allele frequency of the ESNPs. So you can see that there is actually a pretty strong correlation of 0.8 between the two when we look worldwide. But I think even more importantly than that is when you look within particular regions of the world, you actually see that this is replicated multiple independent times. So it's not just that we're looking at a difference, say, between the African populations and the Asian populations, but even just you know, within Asia, you even see this type of trend. All right, so now what does this actually mean? So we can, we can replace latitude by something which is a little more intuitive here, which is just the amount of sunlight. So on average, when you're near the equator, you're going to have more sunlight than if you're not. And so it, the directionality here makes perfect sense because those populations close to the equator, they tend to get more UV, they have a lower expression score, which means lower expression of these UV down-regulated genes. So what we're seeing here is actually when we have this gene set, which is a dynamically responding gene set to UV radiation, there's actually this down-regulation is actually somewhat hardwired into the genomes now of these populations that are present at the equatorial latitudes. And so it's almost as if they're sort of expecting more UV radiation, so they've downregulated it, these genes already. Um, so that's, of course, speculation as to the actual you know, mechanism, the selective pressure, but it, the directionality does make sense with what we would expect. All right, so that was the first gene set. The second one uh, is a pretty general set called cell proliferation. But when we look at the actual genes that come up in here, it's actually very highly enriched for cytokines that are specifically stimulating immune cell proliferation. And so it's interesting here, again, we're seeing a correlation with latitude. And so again, we can't really know why this is, but we can speculate that it might have to do with a latitudinal gradient of the actual diversity of pathogens at different latitudes. Again, something that we could just you know, think further about. Um, but again, this is replicated in, in three out of the four separate populations or, or regions of the world. Um, all right, so the third gene set is diabetes pathways. This uh, is a number of different pathways that have been combined um, in, a, in, a, in a database. And so here we're seeing, again, latitude coming up. Um, this is interesting. I mean, again, we don't know why exactly this would be, but it's possible that um, you know, it could have something to do with the latitudinal gradient and type 2 diabetes risk, which has been shown now in many different studies 
um, and that's you know, something that we need to do a lot more work on to figure out. But it's, it, it, it is interesting that, that we can possibly relate this uh, to a disease uh, such as type 2 diabetes, uh, which does have a, a clear geographic component in uh, its genetic susceptibility. All right, so to summarize that second part, uh, we have polygenic gene expression adaptation, I think, has occurred in recent human evolution. Uh, these examples that I'm showing you, such as UV response and immune cell proliferation, are the first examples we have of this mode of selection acting in humans, but I think it's probably just the tip of the iceberg um, that we're going to find many more as we get more data and more refined methods for looking at these. And I think this method can also be applied to other gene sets and other population-specific variables and species and so on. Uh, it's a, I think it could be applied pretty broadly once we get uh, data for these other species. Okay, so that was the first part. Um, it looks like... Can I ask a question, Hunter? Yes. So does it worry you that these SNPs and other things, because the way they're discovered, are biased towards more common having a more common, because otherwise you won't pick up the association in the, right. in the that, that they're more common and therefore have a different geographic, you expect them to have a different geographic dispersion. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely, right. So there's there's all kinds of biases in the little frequencies that go into this. So the first bias is what SNPs were put on the array, because those were ascertained mostly in European populations. And second of all, which ones are just common enough to, to actually you know, give us any signal in this type of analysis. Um, and those are both important concerns. So we do try to control for that by, um, you know, well, with, with the first part of the talk, when we're doing this uh, actual just comparing the synonymous and, and sorry, the non-synonymous and regulatory, we are matching for low frequencies with those, those negative control sets. So that's how we try to control for that there. I mean, with this, with the second part, it is absolutely true that if we have rare eSNPs that are regulating some pathway, we're just going to have very low power to find that. So the, I think the only solution there is expanding these eSNP studies so we can actually pick up rare SNPs and doing more genotyping so we can measure their little frequencies in a large number of populations. So for now, these methods are absolutely just restricted to these more common alleles uh, that are present worldwide. But I think there's nothing intrinsic about the method that, that makes it that way. It's just a limitation of the data that we currently have. Okay, any other questions about that? Yep. Um, wouldn't it make more sense to the median of the expression set if you really thought that the entire pathway was important to be going into the direction? Because you're sort of relying on the fact that it's the median that like one gene that could be like, you know, controlling yeah. you know, the given Sure, yeah. I mean, we actually, we have tried the median, and it gives you it gives you the exact same three gene sets, so I just presented it with the mean. Um, but, you're, yeah, I agree. You can make an argument either way, I think. So, I mean, median is more robust to outliers, so if you say outliers, I don't care about outliers, the median is better. If you say outliers might actually make a difference, that having super high expression of one component in the pathway is important, then maybe you would want to take the mean. So. Either way, right, well, it wouldn't be single gene because you still have a lot of others in there, but it would be more influenced by single outliers. So, right, so you could, you could argue it either way, and I think I don't have a personal preference, really, um, but I am happy to say that, that it doesn't matter for this particular case that we get the same three gene sets either way. So, yes? In your comparison of non like regulatory adaptations, is there any way of estimating the effect size of uh, mutations in these two groups, either by looking at the effect on the expression level uh, in the known studies or by estimating the selection coefficient? Yes, right. That um, would be great. So the, yeah, so the question is about whether we can estimate effect sizes for these different variants. And that is something we have thought about, which we would very much like to do. Um, it is rather tricky. So. On, at one level, for regulated, regulatory ones, we can certainly estimate an effect size on expression. That's anytime you map an eSNP, you do automatically get an estimate of that. So that at that level, it would be okay. But then the question is, if you have, say, 10 genes in a pathway or a protein complex, then do you really want to weight them all equally? Because if you have twice as much effect on this enzyme than on that one, but maybe this other, this one with the smaller effect is actually a more important enzyme. That's the, the key step where you can actually, you know, if it's rate limiting, for instance, that's the one where it really matters. So 
we have thought about ways to incorporate that, but I think, you know, there's, it, it might not help that much if, if it's actually, you know, the main effects are in which genes are the key steps uh, within these different gene sets. So it's something we could explore, but it's not clear to me whether that would, you know, really be the, the key thing to do or not. It might be. Um, for, for the not anonymous, it's actually much harder to estimate an effect size. There we don't have the same type of quantitative information. So you could try to do that based on conservation or something, but that would be very messy. So it would be tough. Uh, yep. Quick question for defining the ESNPs. Again, I think this is going to make you more conservative. Are they always just associated with the nearest gene, or how do you know which gene a particular ESNP is controlling? Yeah, so, so we only look within 100 KB of the gene, and it's not necessarily the nearest gene, but what we do is, uh, when, any, when anyone is doing ESNP mapping, you have a set of genotypes and you have a set of gene expression levels, and so you're correlating basically every SNP within 100 KB with those genes that's nearby. And so there might be multiple genes, but then you can just see which gene is it actually correlated with, and then that is the gene that's the putative target. So that's how we make that. <coughs> So it doesn't have to be the nearest gene, although it most often is. Okay, so it actually looks like um, due to me talking for too long and some great questions here, I'm not going to actually be able to go into this evolution of translation. I can give you the 30 second version. Uh, and I also have a few things I want to show you uh, just after that. But, the basic idea, and you can see this is just uh, came out in Advanced Online and Genome Research, so you're welcome to go look it up. Um, the interesting thing here is that we can study the evolution of translation now, in addition to the evolution of, of uh, gene expression levels, of mRNA, like, like we have been uh, in this first part of the talk. And the idea there is that we can actually compare the quantities of uh, the magnitudes of these changes in translation versus transcription. And it turns out the two in yeast, where we're looking, are actually of roughly comparable magnitude. That when we look between two different species, you see these changes in translation about as often as you see changes in transcription. And moreover, when you see these changes at both levels, they tend to counteract one another. So if you have an mRNA that's upregulated, it doesn't actually necessarily mean the protein is upregulated as well, because more often than not, we see that the translation of that gene is downregulated. So they tend to counteract each other to overall lead to a, a preservation of uh, the translation rates, the protein production rates. Um, so that's the punchline. Um, I also just wanted to skip ahead then, since <coughs> we are almost out of time. I thought I would leave with a couple final thoughts. So, so using hybrids uh, is something that uh, I was going to show you about with this ribosome <laughs> profiling work. And it's also something that my lab is doing a lot of these days. And hybrids across a vast uh, diversity of different types of organisms. And I think it has a lot of promise. And I just wanted to talk for a minute about uh, some of that work that we have uh, that's ongoing. So yeast is our, has been our main workhorse so far for doing hybrid work. So you can take two different species of yeast, even if they're millions of years diverged, and make very healthy, happy hybrids between them. And the neat thing there is you can then study these hybrids because they have two very different genomes coexisting within every one of their nuclei. And then you can ask questions about things like the genome-wide divergence in cis-regulation, which is something we're very interested in because we can use that as a way to study the genome-wide gene expression adaptations. So we've now gone on from just yeast. We're looking at hybrids in uh, cichlid fish and mice uh, and chickens as well. And each of these has different questions that we can uh, answer. So for instance, with the cichlids, we're looking at evolution of mating strategies. With mice, uh, we're looking a lot at different evolution of, of genomic imprinting, which is an epigenetic phenomenon where the parental inheritance determines the expression of different alleles. Um, with chickens, we're also looking to see whether there might be imprinting there. Uh, but if you think about it, I mean, all these different species that we're looking at and that everyone else in the field are looking at really just occupy this tiny, tiny little branch of the evolutionary tree up there. Um, there's a quite a wide, a wide variety of these species that are just completely uncovered by these uh, types of uh, methods. And so we're actually, we're very lucky to, uh, to find uh, an example of a halophile in Archaea that can actually form hybrids uh, with each other. So this is a pretty interesting case because these don't sexually reproduce, but these uh, different species can actually form bridges and, and exchange genetic material and recombine and so forth and actually create uh, hybrids 
between one another. So this is actually it was discovered back in the 80s that they could do this. And so now we've done RNA sequencing on these hybrids, and we're using that in order to answer some questions about whether these trends that we see in eukaryotes are also conserved in uh, you know, very distant prokaryotes uh, from these guys. So now, I think, but the underlying theme with this hybrid work is you really need to know beforehand, before you embark on one of these studies, what species can actually hybridize. Uh, and that's, you know, of course, most species that you, that you look at out there can't hybridize. So it would be very useful to have uh, a database where we could actually know which species hybridize and which can't. Because even in the case where you might have you know, mutual attraction between two different species, uh, such as between you know, this amphibian and this uh, professor, you're really <laughs> not guaranteed that, uh, to be able to get a hybrid. Uh, so this is one of those cases. So I was actually pretty happy a couple years ago to find a database that, that did exactly this. So this is um, called the Hybrid Database, and it's run out of this place uh, called the Center for Origins Research. And it was a very useful find uh, for me in my lab because it, it does exactly what we were hoping. It is a, a really vast database of hybrids um, that are just from all over the evolutionary tree. And these are all have links to the primary literature so we can look up the actual evidence associated with each of these hybrids. And this has let us actually figure out, well, which different hybrids can we go after in order to you know, study their evolution of gene regulation or anything else we might be interested in. So. Uh, I would recommend this for anyone else interested in hybrids. However, there is a caveat, which is about a year ago, uh, when I tried to put in a search for this database, it actually uh, gave me page not found. And it turns out that this uh, database was shut down about a year ago. And so the reason for that was actually something I think we're all familiar with these days, and that is budget cuts. Um, so it is a, a sad story, but this uh, very useful database run by this uh, core, the Center for Origins Research, uh, was shut down due to these budget cuts. Uh, but reading about these budget cuts, I was actually a little bit taken aback to hear that the CORE is one of the premier organizations advancing a solid, scientific, biblically-based biblically <laughs> understanding of origins of the world today. So this, unbeknownst to me, was actually run by a creationist group uh, that was using <laughs> hybrids as evidence against evolution. Uh, uh, so I think pretty pretty interesting case here uh, where they were accidentally doing a, a great service. <laughs> uh, I think we all know, you know, living in this country in particular, there is a lot of anti-evolution sentiment among uh, certain segments of society. Um, for instance, asking questions that probably would flummox any evolutionary biologist. If man evolved from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? I don't know. That's, you got me. So I think it's, it's a really nice example here with this uh, database that despite you know, all of this, uh, this, this vitriol, you know, they're actually giving back to the evolutionary. <laughs> and so I think that if Jesus were around today, then not only would he publish some plus one, but he would also want his number one fans in this country, the creationists, to restore funding to the core in order to continue their mission of helping evolutionary biologists, even if by accident. <laughs> All right, so with that, I just want to acknowledge uh, my lab, a great set of people, and our funding, and you for listening. Thank you.